You know, a lot of people don't know this, but one of the first um, rock stars, I mean, real big rock stars in the world, had a glass eye. And a lot of people didn't even realize that. They were too distracted watching this artist play. He used to shake his head around and his hair would fall in front of his face. And he did that on purpose. He did it to, to distract from his eye. Uh, because too frequently, uh, you know, modern culture has a tendency of uh, viewing flawed things as disposable or as something that just doesn't need to be maintained or invested. So you can't really blame a guy back in 1955 for thinking that something like that might hurt his career. So he grew his hair long and he put it in front of his face, kind of a sleight of hand, you know, like a magic trick, just distract. And then the guy who was opening for him saw it and was so in love with the idea that he adopted it himself. And the guy who was opening for him was Elvis Presley, and the artist's name was Bill Haley. Bill Haley had a glass eye. Elvis Presley never figured that out, that Bill Haley always seemed to drive the crowd wild whenever he would shake his head around and, and do a bit of shouting. So Elvis picked it up and ran with the ball and made it his own. This guitar is kind of similar in that way, that it has this break in the neck, and it's distracting. Uh, but I don't want to delete the break of the neck. It's part of the story. It's part of the guitar. It, it's part of, it's a lure that it's been out and it's been played and it's, it's been experienced, you know. So what we're going to do today is we're going to distract a little bit. We're going to play a little sleight of hand, like a card game. And uh, we're going to make sure that the break is still there and, and still, you know, present and understood and accepted. But at the same time, it's got some flair over it. It's got something that says, yeah, I've been broken, but here I am, you know, and I'm still playing. And, uh... You know, that's what we're going to get around to today. Because the guitar deserves it, to tell you the truth. It plays wonderfully. I pass it between friends and, and people love it. So this is a great way for us to take something that maybe uh, might have just been forever a, a broken headstock guitar and turn it into something with some flair. Turn it into something with some personality and, uh, and get it going down the road again. Okay, so now that we can take a closer look at this, uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to clean up the headstock. Uh, we're going to clean up the face of the headstock first. Uh, so when the headstock was snapped off, unfortunately this was not the type of uh, snap where it broke in a favorable direction. If it uh, breaks uh, where the nut is and it starts to come downward, that means that the headstock's being pulled forward and the actual string tension is going to maintain the geometry for the most part. Sorry, Jameson is really noisy today. Uh, this headstock broke forward. This one basically was dropped probably on its back and the headstock pushed forward. And when it did, uh, they did manage to get it glued back down again. But what had happened was in the moment that it was able to lean forward, it compressed the finish right along this line. And then when they straightened it out and pushed it back, the finish then cracked along this line and then left an exposed piece where we have uh, wood here with just a bit of the black, the thin finish that is screen printed upon. So what we have to do is we have to get rid of some of this looseness where it's delaminated from the wood uh, and get it to where it's kind of like this edge right here where it's black right up until the very edge. That means that the bond between the lacquer and the wood is still there on that little piece right there. So what we have to do is get rid of this guy, clean this up a little bit, and then we have to, with a toothpick, take clear coat and just kind of dab it in here so that we can build it up and uh, get it to the point where we can wet sand it a little bit and have it look like it's completely level with that section right there. Okay, so now if we're looking back at the headstock and we look really low, what we've got is these sections scratched out. And basically what you're looking for when you're doing this is you're looking for those brown areas. So for instance, if you wanted an example, you can see the check lines here where the delamination has started. We're going to leave those alone because those are actually kind of pretty cool. And we're not going to really mess with these cracks, but this space right here is low. Same with this one and this one where the uh, lacquer had chipped away. So I pulled away the last of the delaminated stuff. And now what we're going to go to, we're going to go ahead and do is uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, fill it in now that Jameson's yelling at me again. Okay, so now if you're looking at this spot and this spot and this spot, what you'll notice is, is I dabbed with a toothpick that I broke in half, so I had a broad uh, edge to it. And I kind of 
bang that edge against the side of the table uh, to flatten it out. And then I just pushed the finish up to the extreme edges <laughs> of the cracks. And then what I did was, as it started to settle in and dry, I would just take the actual toothpick and tap a single drop in the center of the mass and let it just kind of push its way out to the outside edges. So this way, I don't have any overflow on top of the finish. I simply have a mound that kind of rises above but meets the edges of the crack. Also, another thing is, is that as I was using the toothpick, I could very vividly see areas of brown around the cracks instantly become black again. And what's happening there is that the thinness of the finish, the lacquer, means that as it hits the finish, it is drawn into the cracks and then actually starts to seal up and relaminate some of the broken edges of that finish down and in. So you've got a good bond with the finish, but also at the same time, the finish is now acting as a glue, which prevents the chipping of progressing or delaminating further. Okay, so we kind of got the headstock um, <clears throat> at least to the point where it's it's remotely satisfactory and now we have to address the damaged area to the back of the neck. So obviously as I had mentioned before, uh, they did manage to get the headstock brake stabilized but they obviously didn't doll it up. Uh, it looks like they might have made some sort of go at painting this and then kind of gave up. I don't really know. Uh, anyway, if you look over here towards the top of the headstock, just above the cereal, you'll see a bunch of orange peel. Uh, what that means is, is that the person who is painting failed to do a wet coat at the very end at which it would gel, or they failed to wet sand it and then buff it back. It's kind of one or the other. You have to do one or the other. Uh, because there are also residues of paint on the back of the neck where there's orange peel. So what it looks like happened was, it looks like they sprayed the whole thing and then came back here and sanded it again, which means that it might have actually broken twice. But I got this guitar for damn near nothing, so I don't really care. It sounds awesome, but I would like it to look like less scary. Also, another thing is, is that this is completely unfinished, so this is totally open to the elements, so sweat from my hands can get in here and start to degrade the actual bond of the glue. Uh, the glue is pretty robust uh, that you use for wood. It's pretty much stronger than wood sometimes if you get the actual glue joint really, really tightly bonded and you don't have a lot of wood loss. Um, but that's not going to last long if this is just left wide open. <clears throat> so there's a bit of a ridge right here I can feel where there was some material loss uh, that I can feel with my thumb. But the rest of this is actually pretty good. Um, you know, you can run the pencil across it and not hear a notch but right here you can hear that notch so we got to get rid of that so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use uh, the very tip of a blade and kind of dig a tiny little canal right here and then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you uh, how to use Elmer's glue uh, and do kind of the same thing we did on the headstock where you're just kind of doing a droplet and then letting it kick off and then sanding after that Okay, there we go. So, like I said, you're just using a toothpick to kind of lightly dab 
inside the lines. And I'm going to show you guys what I mean by inside the lines. And you might have noticed that when I was taking the knife, I might have been doing something a little bit scary to you, which was etching a little valley above uh, the cracks. Okay, so this is us zooming in and close up looking at this crack. Right now. See, the problem with a crack is, is that when you actually look at the surface, what you've got is a perfectly flat milled surface that meets a sudden crevasse, and then you've got another perfect surface. These two things make for a very sharp edge. It also makes for a very minimal amount of space in which any adhesive can grab on. You've got a smooth surface that's been finished, another smooth surface that's been finished right there, and then one very, very small imperfection. So what you have to do is you have to actually create an environment in which the adhesive is going to have something to bond to. So essentially what you've got to do is you've got to make a little V-type shape in the crack. So let's say that this were the crack right here going down into the surface. Okay, and there's the wood. This is the finish. The crack is going down through the finish of the wood. So what you've got to do is you've actually got to create a cradle for the adhesive. Now some people just use a file, knock a wedge in there. I actually prefer not to do that. Here's what I prefer to do. What I actually prefer to do is to create a valley in which the edges are smoothed down into the crack. And the reason is this, is that if I sand it this way, I'm using sandpaper, um, I might be using a knife edge to get it started, I'm creating abrasions in which this area has a really good bonding surface and will accept adhesive. Also, another thing is, is now that I've put the adhesive right here, what's going to happen is, is I have to overbuild it. So I'm going to look for that essential line and I'm going to build up and over. I'm going to fill the adhesive in over it. And the reason is, is because as it dries, it's going to actually shrink and then it's going to be maybe even a little bit under and you might have to do a second application. But if you actually build up and over as it dries, it'll start to flatten out and it'll leave you with a relatively even surface that you can then wet sand and get a good smooth uh, for, um, look to it. Also another thing is too, is if you're creating this nice thin departure on the edge, it means that the adhesive is more flexible there. It's more capable of uh, being able to take fluctuations in tension and or angle. So essentially uh, you'll have a more, um, a more muted transmission of the crack through the finish because you know you can kind of always see it and with a black light you could definitely always see it and also we're not trying to fool anybody we're just trying to make it look good I don't want to hide the repair from anybody I just want to make sure that the repair is is indicative of a job that's done well so you Now over here, I left this so that we can very clearly uh, display this. If you actually look right here, there's still a little buildup of glue right there. And I kind of got a little mound. And then right next to it, right there, you'll see some shiny spots. Now, you can do two different things. You can keep sanding, which eh, I'm not too excited about doing. This part of the neck on uh, Les Paul is notoriously the weakest. It's very, very thin. There's a reason these necks are graceful because they're small and they're slender and they're kind of delicate, uh, which is nice when you're playing it. It's just not nice when you're dropping it. So you could sand it further and get that to go further down. Or if you wanted to, you could do another little fill, but the fill is not gonna stick to that space because it's shiny. 
it's got finish on top of it that has a wax component that's in there to give it that gloss. So if you spray right over it, it's going to have trouble bonding. So what you got to do is you got to do either one of two things. Number one, you got to knock this down and clear up those little shiny spots with a little bit more sandpaper. Uh, and I would suggest instead of just blanket sanding over the entire area, try to be very focused. Wrap the sandpaper into a wedge, put it at your fingertips so you can feel that ridge and hit it a couple times and it'll knock it down. There we go, we got it all prepped. We've got all surfaces sanded and ready to paint. We're gonna put down the first color, we're gonna put down the red. And I'm gonna show you what I got in mind. It's kind of like a, I don't know how to express it. Looks like Chinese chips. You'll see what I mean. There we go, time to start taping it. step one so you can see in the valley in the center those two little two little things that I did there that I have to still shoot the black on the back of the headstock and that have the single stinger come down but I am actually pretty pleased to it it's so friggin bright the red's so bright against the uh, Sun that it's actually the camera has trouble uh, focusing in on it okay so there we go and uh, we've got the paint on there and you might notice that I sanded that little spot right in the middle uh, and the reason is, is because I didn't want to spray black over it and have it translate. So I just knocked it down with a little bit of 600 so you can feel it. And there was a little bit of a distortion there and uh, some finish build up. So that's pretty good. So we're going to go ahead and take this thing and uh, go ahead and tape it off again. I've already got this uh, side taped off. Uh, and then we'll start shooting paint again. That the blacks kicked off a little bit. We're looking at it, and what we realize is, is that we have good grain representation through here, and then a nice blend where it gets up into a sheen like a wet coat. So when we shoot it with the clear, we won't have any weird transitional lines or anything like that. Now here's the only thing that I do like to do on these, uh, is that what I like to do is when you're down to the point where you're about to clear it. You don't have to wet sand the headstock or anything like that. You can shoot clear right over it as long as you're satisfied with the way it looks. I'm going to wet sand around this edge just to clean it up a little bit. But I want to show you guys this real quick. When you've got these spears and they're coming out this way, you don't want to sand up and into them. And the reason is, is as you're sanding up and into them, the sandpaper might catch on the finish or stop for a second and then have uh, more applied pressure. It might stick 
or it might tear the line or you might mess up your tape line and it doesn't look as clean. So what you do is, first off, make sure this thing real clean because any debris you're gonna have scratches. And then you're just going to take it, hold it off the guitar, and then as you're coming down, you sweep towards the center of the neck. And if you do this, this 600 grit is gonna clean up the grain of the wood, the exposed wood. It's gonna get rid of all those little flyaways that like to absorb finish and then give you a kind of a spiky finish when you're done. And you know, you can kind of feel it out. And also this closes the grain up. It kind of shoves some of the dust down into the open grain. And then when you paint with the clear, the dust actually matches with the clear, creates a fill, and it keeps the pores from becoming too exaggerated after it kicks off. If I run my hand over that, that is nice. That's really perfect. I'm almost tempted to leave it as it is, but I know it won't stay that way. So we're going to go back over to the other side here and just kind of drop down into it. And this is going to knock down that edge so that we get an imperceivable line all the way up to the neck so that when you're playing it, you might be able to see the stinger, but you're not going to be able to feel it is nice. So, a couple quick passes again right down the middle. Just a real quick clean up setup. And you might go into like freak out mode because you're looking over here and you're seeing all these dust, uh, you know, particulates and scratches, but you actually wipe them off with the rag and get the area clear. And uh, after you do, you realize that those tiny little scratches there, they're, they're barely perceptible. You're not going to be able to feel them. Uh, and that uh, the clear coat is going to fill them in and give you a really nice sheet, which is great. Okay, so we've got the back of the neck sanded, not finished sanded, mind you, just kind of, uh, we're just looking to scuff it. So if you look, you should see no shiny spots, uh, especially on the headstock. Um, now you'll see a couple little spots here and there, um, but the truth of it is, is that um, that's okay because once again, we're not finished sanding. I just used some 600 to knock all the peaks and valleys off of it. Uh, you know, you may be tempted to go for a really soft grit at the beginning. Like I was saying before in the video, try not to do that. The heavier grit is going to give you a good planing surface. It's only going to knock down highs quick, and it's going to leave lows alone because you don't have to apply a lot of pressure. And then anything that you get, like these little spaces right here, or maybe the spots in between where you've got some height on uh, paint buildup, you can kind of leave those alone. Uh, you know, the beauty of a stinger is, is that the shape of the paint means that you're not going to feel it. You're not going to feel the wall of paint. You know, if it was just a straight line right there, you'd very clearly feel it. It's kind of nice. It's gradual. So what you want to do is just kind of take it to like 600, get it to this point where it's matte all the way around, and then start moving up to 1,000 and 1,500 pretty quick because you don't want to create more scratches. Um, you know, and you... You're fighting a bit of a fight here. You know, this is a thin finish. We've deliberately done it thin, so you don't want to burn it by hitting it with too hard of a uh, grain as well. Okay, so uh, here's what we've got. <clears throat> we are all wet sanded up. We've got uh, almost up to 3,000 grit on the headstock and on the back of the neck. It feels really, really good. Uh, but when I hold it up to the light, I can still see 
some shiny spots and some dull spots because we haven't we haven't buffed it yet um you know and uh that's where you get a lot of the depth and the clarity of color um you know the 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 contrast and everything like that on this sort of work um you know so it's kind of fun it's like an it's like the unveil doesn't really happen until the very end so anyway let's get this outdoors and uh let's take the last step and see what this thing looks like when it's all said and done There you have it. Uh, we got the neck all buttoned up. It's not totally done yet. Um, I waited a couple days to wet sand this thing because you do have a lot of grain proliferation. If you wet sand too fast, uh, you'll create a plain surface that is a flat surface, which has great reflectivity and very little distortion. But the only problem is, is that as it continues to cure, it'll then start to texture slightly um, and the grain will continue to pull that, that curing solvent down and into itself. So typically you want to wait about two or three days. Now I know in the past I've talked about how Gracie's you can basically wet sand day of, and that's still totally true. But in an effort to try to make less work for yourself, uh, we'll be penny wise and pound foolish with our time. Give it a couple days to kick off. So am I satisfied? <laughs> yes, I am. I totally satisfied with this. What are you kidding? Uh, you know, before I had just kind of accepted that it was either going to just be painted black and be kind of, unremarkable um, and then not only be unremarkable but be unremarkable for a reason in which something is broken and ultimately that's not very desirable but I actually really am happy that I went this route um, you know because you guys know I, I always like having an individual flair on each guitar you know it's an instrument and it's it's reflective of the person that's playing it you know whether that be that somebody buys this because it reflects with them now or it resonates with them now or, you know, because maybe you're doing this to your own guitar and you're kind of just making it your own thing. You know, I always like having personal touches on an instrument. Um, you know, it just makes it a little bit more interesting. So definitely very pleased with the way that this came out. Great reflectivity. Once again, it's not done. I'm going to buff it again in about another two days, so I'm not going to string it right away. Um, but uh, the headstock just looks so much better. I mean, you remember how awful that looked. The bell was missing. Um, there were all of these uh, textured ruts, you know, around here. You can still see a slight distortion to the reflectivity. And a lot of that is because the overlay on top, unfortunately, it's like tin foil. It's never going to take its original size completely uh, or its original uh, dynamic. It's, it's not going to lay out the same. Uh, you know, once they're altered, they're altered. Uh, but it really did come out really great. And uh, I'm not even finished buffing and I already got the blend on the uh, heel really good. I mean, especially right there, you can see that there's no differentiation of color, which is really, really fantastic. Now, if somebody were to buy this or have it checked out by a, uh, a broker, then obviously they would spot uh, the things in the black light. Uh, this section has a combination of factory paint and overlay worked into it, so there'd be a discrepancy there. And obviously with the headstock, uh, every single surface has been refinished, so you would get um, a red flag under a black light. But uh, that's good because we don't want people being dishonest when this thing starts to travel down the road. Um, I like how if you do look at this very, very closely, you can see that the grain proliferation right around here stops. Uh, so anybody looking at it is going to know that there's a bit of work there done. Uh, but, but it does look, it, it just looks cool. I like it. And uh, unintentional as it was, I kind of like how, you know, we started off with a, uh, sorry, plane, one moment. You know, and like I was saying at the very beginning, um, you know, we started off with, uh, you know, something that was aesthetically flawed. We haven't hidden that. We've just celebrated that. And that's pretty rad. So I'm really pleased with this. This thing, when I first got it, it just, it just wasn't really ringing for me. It didn't have a concept and it played wonderfully, but it just, you know, it just didn't have that personality. And now it's got a little bit more. 
Anyway, that's the video for this week. Um, gonna be at long last increasing the frequency of videos, but this one was a bit of a long one. It really took a week. So, uh, you know, apologies for the delay on that. And um, hopefully you guys enjoyed. Hopefully you guys got some ideas. You know, and the beauty of all this sort of stuff is, is that, uh, you know, make it, make it weird, you know, make it your own, you know, change it, use different colors, do different shapes, experiment with taping patterns and things like that. You know, you can always just try it on a scrap of cardboard just to get it wired, you know, as far as uh, being comfortable running tape lines and the contour that you prefer and everything like that. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, take, take an opportunity where something goes wrong, something is broken, something's not working. And instead of just, you know, putting it back the way it was, you know, uh, using that opportunity to uh, take advantage of that and, and, and make it something a bit more personal, something with a, a bit more of a, you know, an anthropomorphic edge. Anyway, guys, that's the video right then and there. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I am going to go string this thing and go play the hell out of it. Have a wonderful afternoon. Go step out in the sunlight and we will see you guys in about two weeks.